wait a while. Well, after he passes away and there's Tarantino biographies and retrospectives and all this stuff, people are going to be singing the praises of this one. <laughs> we'd maybe spend a little bit of time just talking through Tarantino, why we like him, why we don't, what we think about just different aspects of his directing style. There's obviously a lot of people that like Tarantino, want to hear about Tarantino, have been influenced by him. Obviously, the audience, you know, they, they want to hear what we have to say. But why is he a director that we even like in the first place, I guess, is a good place to start. What is it about him that we like? And is there something about him that we do not like my introduction point was Pulp Fiction as well. I didn't see it in the theater. Mm -hmm. I ordered it on pay-per-view. My uncle had seen it in the theater. He came in. He was like, I saw this. This movie was effing terrible. He was telling my crew, he's like, it's one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. So this is a Russ movie. This is the kind of movie this kid would like. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? But he said, but I'll tell you, there was one part I could not stop laughing on. There's this part where they're driving in a car and John Travolta accidentally shoots the guy in the face and then they argue about going over a bump. And he's like, I could not stop laughing. And he's like, the rest of the movie was boring as shit. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. I caught it just like what you said. Immediately fell in love. I was like, whoa, what yeah. the fuck is this? The soundtrack, even those songs blew my mind. Dude, yep. hearing Let's Stay Together by Al Green and Pulp Fiction at 11, 12 years old got me into R&B music. I listened to so many 70s, late 60s, and 80s R&B music, and it literally started from hearing Let's Stay Together in Pulp Fiction. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I don't know how much longer after watching this and to diving into the soundtrack and that I that I moved on to Reservoir Dogs because I, I was think lucky it was really quick. I don't I think I knew enough about where to look for things yet. I know I took because this was pre-internet. Yeah, right? and my recollection too was there was internet, but not as we no, know it today. Exactly. And I remember finding the Reservoir Dogs script and reading that before I watched the actual movie. Really? I did. And I was like, damn, this movie sounds awesome. Like, this is the guy that did Pulp Fiction. No shit. This freaking shit sounds incredible. Maybe I bought the VHS at that point. I'm not sure. But from there, it was watching all of them theatrically as they came out. I miss Death Proof and Inglorious Bastards. You the least bit bad about it. Pulp Fiction's an amazing soundtrack. Reservoir Dogs is pretty strong. Jackie Brown's yeah. pretty strong too. There's a couple of stinkers on there. I feel I, like. Oh, I think Jackie Brown's way better than Reservoir Dogs soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Reservoir Dogs soundtrack's weak, but I don't blame anyone on that. They didn't have any money. Yeah, no one knew what, what it was. Yeah, they probably did all that just to get stuck in the middle with you. Yeah, that's why everything much. else is like they yeah. miss. Jackie yeah. Brown's a strong sound. I honestly, I'd rather listen to the Jackie Brown soundtrack at this point. Yeah, even back then, I think it's a little more Pulp Fiction. The soundtrack's just a little. It's jar. I mean, you got like you know cool in the gang al green then it's like captain kangaroo smoking yeah. cigarettes and yeah. you know it's brilliant but it's yeah. all over the fucking place yeah. you know and just but just his use of music and not a score i think that's an interesting yeah. way to approach it oh, it's yeah. like i'm going to use songs that i love that inspired me or were inspired by this era or whatever it is to like keep my story moving like this is how i want to this is part of my storytelling is mm -hmm. these songs it's like i'm i'm looking for the rhythm that this movie needs to play in. but that really helps me sink my hooks into oh hey maybe i maybe we'll make this when you you do it right and the music and the movie kind of goes in sync with each other it's just kind of like you're flying or you're skating or something and those are always just like some of the funnest parts to watch with an audience because they're really engaged again it's like his hand in basically everything like not just composing or anything but it's like this is what this feeling of this movie should be and i feel like without those these movies aren't the same it's like a character in the movie is like, what's this oh, yeah. next surf rock song that's going to come on or this next, you know, seventies. Dude, I love when, uh, when Beaumont gets in the trunk and then Ordell gets back in the car and he's putting the gloves yeah, on. You know, sinister. Like, oh, fuck. Shit. Yeah. But like when you listen to that, it's not a sinister song. No, no, but that <laughs> strawberry letter 20, that's not a goddamn sinister no. song, but just there's something about that. He's one of the, yeah. it's like, shit, I get like goosebumps. I'm like, I'm in this I is know. hard. The nonlinear storytelling, Something about that I really like. And I think watching it from him is what has made me like it in other movies, sort of showing or foreshadowing or showing things out of sequence to where you're a little puzzled. And then once everything does come together, it like clicks instead of just going from point A to point B. And and the whole Pulp Fiction thing, it's like, oh, what? John Travolta? I thought, just thought I saw him get killed. It's mm -hmm. like, why are you bringing me John Travolta again? Just kind of playing with it. It's like, these are three stories that are interconnected. I don't need to tell it in order. I can show it in this order, but I don't need to. Pretty smart, huh? 
what makes it work so well in Pulp Fiction is that so much time has gone on since you've seen Pumpkin and Honey Bunny. Yep. But not enough time to where you forgot it. Got some. Coffee. So when it goes back, you're, oh yeah. What happened shit. to them? Now we're going to get to see how this plays out with our two main characters involved. Yeah. The idea of, oh, he riffs on all this other stuff. He does. Mm -hmm. And he's never shied away from it. That's why it doesn't bother me. He never shied. I've always looked at him as a DJ. It's like he's taking, he's riffing on the things he loves, which most people, maybe now, but like you said, there was no internet back then. Most people didn't know a lot of their, their introduction to these genre flicks, these exploitation flicks, grindhouse flicks were through him yeah Anna, they were for me yep i solely credit him for getting me into a lot of not only movies but genres yeah he has an obsession clearly with those types of movies he elevates that material he elevates yeah. the b movie stuff that he's riffing on and it becomes its own thing he's you great know? at translating he's it he's and, he's, great at that. and he's not talking down to it no he never does that dude it's honoring it and it's cherishing it it's celebrating it yeah. but he's so good at it he unintentionally is honoring it and we're yeah. getting what we love but he's like making it better it's just in his writing though because it he's not even in Pulp Fiction there's nothing there's no lofty aspirations of, there's no messages he's trying to get across that's something that's creeping in into his later films yeah our messages shit negro that's all you had to say it's poetry it flows it just has this great cadence and then you get a samuel jackson or yeah. you get a uh a hans landa <laughs> yeah who can really deliver when, who did, when they know how to they know they're the instrument they know how to sing that dialogue i'm basically quoting him he said this shit can't trust the fucking word comes out of your mouth when you hear quentin tarantino talk you realize that this man is like a student of film. I don't yeah. know that I've ever heard directors on commentaries or on behind the scenes or whatever talk about movies the way that he has. Like, he's a film geek just like anyone. You hear him talk about like, oh, I, I was raised on yes. Bava. I was raised on Sergio yeah. Leone. I, I was like, I didn't even and know what a people, movie was until I saw these things. It's like, he's saying, talking like we talk. And you're saying Mario Bava? Most people don't fucking reference him. No. You don't hear Steven Spielberg talking about Mario Bava. Nope. Maybe I would feel differently if he pretended like he never saw this shit or something. Yeah, yeah. If he was like that kind of dude who was just riffing on things and acting like, nah, this is all me, buddy. But like you said, any interview, it's basically his opportunity to recommend movies to yeah. you. Wasn't that film great? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that film was great? That glee, that joy, not only does it come out of him in interviews, it comes across in his movies. Yep. Even, even Death Proof. They're love letters. They are. They really are. What do you think about him inserting himself into these movies as an actor doesn't work <laughs> he's not an actor the fuck are you talking about it works in pulp fiction because that dialogue is so cringy to begin with right. you're like oh dude why would you say that shit yeah. right in in django and Chain, he pretended jimmy to be, me jules yeah, don't you know? fucking jimmy me man <laughs> yeah. in, in django and chain he put an australian accent on it's like dude At you can barely act you go sign the sign like you say it at least in Django, it's only for like 30 seconds or something. Yeah, and Mr. Brown, he's only Mr. Again, Brown for like a second. That's fine. He pads it, out the thing. Exactly. That's if cool. he was casting himself like in main lead roles, it would be an issue. That's both flattering and, and embarrassing. <laughs> Do you want to go through our, our top favorite uh, Tarantino movies, bottom to top? Sure. We'll go simultaneously, see if we're how close we are. We're doing written and directed. No, written no, and directed. I, okay. Yep. Number nine for me is Death Proof. Same. And I've actually watched this movie recently and I still didn't like it. I'm thinking we told Joe ass to shut the fuck up. Cast doesn't work. Cast doesn't work. The dialogue I hated. The second sort of story with the three girls. I did not care about any of them. Wow. <laughs> he just keeps sounding bitter and bitter. <laughs> I mean, I like the Kurt Russell character was cool and I love the muscle car vibe and I love the crash scene where the people's body parts exploded everywhere. That is like the most gnarly scene I've probably seen in one of his movies. It ends in a weird way. I don't know. It's like 40, 50 minutes of a chase and then it's like a roundhouse kick to the know. face with the, the credits. I guess it makes sense. The ending's funny. <laughs> I like the ending, actually. Of death. I think it's the, the literal last scene. Yeah. It's kind of funny. But uh, yeah, number nine, Death Proof. Same reasons as you. It, yep. just, it didn't gel. I just said he's so good that he elevates B material, right? That's his motif. That's what he does. Death Proof set out to be B material. Yeah, right. So it was kind of like, uh, do I just dumb myself yeah, down? Yeah, and that's what it yeah. felt like he did. It was yeah. like, I'm dumbing myself down to fit this concept. Yeah. But that's a very easy mistake to make. Well, the next one on the list for me would be 
Inglorious Bastards at number eight. Let me think. That's weird. It's the same. And I know everyone watching this is going to disagree with We've us. Mentioned, we, did a, we did a segment on Glorious Bastards before, and we yeah. mentioned the exact same thing. And I think you your summary was like, it's not cool. Well, I just reject your hypotheses. It's good, though. Yeah, it is When good. I say it's number eight, I'm still giving this movie... Yes, at, at better 8. than 5 most. Five or eight out of <laughs> yes. ten. Yeah, I just—it's underwhelming for me for it, some it reason. Would. Just keep your fucking mouth shut. Even the music—you go how important that is. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. one of my least favorite soundtracks. Yeah, not good. It's got a few good songs on it. I mean, he ripped the David Bowie shit from Cat People. Even the cast. I mean, Brad Pitt obviously is great, but like some of the other people that fill it out, like Diane Kruger, like you mentioned, Eli and, Roth. I don't know. There just wasn't the same feeling as all the other movies for me. One of his best opening scenes of all time, though, is Inglorious Bastards. Oh, that's an incredible opening scene he's got a he's got he's got a lot of good opening scenes and that's that's so full of tension and my god it is it's brilliant (laughs) but django unchained is the next one for me up the list all right we're gonna start differing number seven for me is django unchained django unchained to me it's like a fun version of Inglorious Bastards with di- with different subject matter. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> it feels the same. It looks the same. It's a revenge. It, it's a revenge. He fell into that trap after yeah. Kill Bill of just doing revenge. Even the way that it was shot, I feel like it just looks the same to me. And it's just a different subject. You got great performances in there. Leonardo DiCaprio fucking steals the show. Samuel L. Jackson, awesome in it, obviously. Jamie Foxx, who I don't really care about too much. I thought he was good. The first day of rehearsal, I'm reading my lines like, yeah, and he said, cut. Can I talk to you for a second? Close mm. the door. <laughs> Listen, you have to be a f***ing slave, okay? He's not cool. He's a f***ing slave. And then, and then, he becomes the hero. But lose that shit. Door swings open, he walks out. And then the Christoph Waltz character is like a sillier version of the evil guy he was playing. I'm bored. I, I I like this one a lot. I, I do like this movie. It's long, but it's it doesn't yeah, feel like it's overstaying. It's welcome. That's like, my main gripe with Django Unchained is that it has two endings. It should have ended, you know, the shootout, but then it just keeps going on again. But I always forgave it. I, I'd always forgiven it because of Sally Menke, his editor. I know. Died I passed away. That. I know. And so his a lot vision. of the issues I had with Django, I kind of like was like, all right, but I, yeah. I'm not going to ride you too hard on this one. My fucking hero. Number seven for me is Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight. I've only watched it once, though. Okay. But. I'm a huge Hateful Eight fan. The Hateful Eight was when I realized, dude's really putting in messages now mm-hmm. in his movies, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I agree with the message he's saying, and it. it's it's an anti-racist message. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with that. I don't know if I watch Tarantino movies for that, though. Mm-hmm. You know? And I felt Hateful Eight, the tone was so fucking mean. It's just a little too much. I've seen Hateful Eight probably about five or six times. <laughs> I love Hateful Eight because like the other three, like I mentioned, Django Unchained and Glorious Bastards and Death Proof, they're all solid, but they're not as solid completely as Hateful Eight on up. It, to me, it, it's Reservoir Dogs again. It's an, It was the first time where I felt like, hey, dude, this is kind of like familiar territory. We're in an enclosed spot with dudes Nobody, who are trying to yeah. figure out some shit. What the fuck are you talking about? Nobody else could have pulled it off. This movie is like three hours of straight dialogue in two places. You have like 30 minutes of dialogue in the stagecoach to get there. And then mm-hmm. the rest of the movie takes place in one place and no one moves except for to maybe go outside into the snow. But I was gripped, even though, you know, you're trying to figure out who's doing what behind the scenes. I don't know. Just them talking was good enough for me. Just some of the little is, s- again, conversations they have. I just I say, enjoy what I say. Just enjoyed listening. That, and I still I'd give it like an eight out of ten. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good movie. It's good. I'm just, uh, but that is actually above Django Unchained for me at my number six is Hateful Eight. So you were number seven, Hateful Eight. What's mm. your number six then? Kill Bill. Okay. Will be my number six. Are you going to be nice? Let's tie six and five. Django, which we just spoke on. Okay. And Kill Bill would okay. be my six and five. I've never loved Kill Bill as much as everyone else. I- I'm sorry. I do love it though. I think it's great. It's funny. The older I get, I do. I'd like to see that whole bloody affair. I think it would be a totally different experience as it stands now. It feels disjointed, which it should, should, I guess, since it's broken up into two. It's like the first one's all action. The second one's all dialogue. And, And I'd like to see it married more i know when you consider it as one movie i think that's the thing it's like it feels like two movies the way they yeah. put together and then, the whole bloody affair probably feel felt like one movie yes, but not an epic yeah, yeah 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 where this just feels like one long action movie that doesn't have much else going on i've seen kill bill multiple times i'm just i'm illustrating why they are ranking lower yeah so it sounds like i'm being more negative 
I've seen it one time in the theater. I haven't seen it since. I saw volume two about three or four times in the theater and have not seen any of them <laughs> at home. Still to the day I die, and I feel the same way now, is like back then as a collector, yeah, you're promised this. all this bloody affair shit. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to buy these. I then. told you. I'm 20, not going to buy these. I told you I'm that still 20 waiting. years ago. I was like, that ain't ever going to happen. I'm yet. still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of funny. It is. <laughs> That's Never. the reason why I have not even seen Kill Bill 1 again to this day. I'm like, I'll just wait and I'm still waiting. I'll at least wait then until the box set comes out with all the 4K shit and then I'll own it for what it is. But if he decides to put out Bloody Affair then, cool, but Kill Bill's my number five. It's Hateful Eight number six, Kill Bill number five. It's it's kind of hard to call this one movie because I like the action-esque bits of the first and I like that Western style of the second. Both of them combined, I think, offer a little bit more to me than what the, the last ones did. There's that nice Uma Thurman callback too from you know Pulp Fiction, like doing something with her again, which I really enjoyed and her performance was awesome. Bitch, you can stop right there. Four, Four is once upon a time in Hollywood. Me too. Whoa! Goddamn outlaw, Rick. It's the most recent one, but boy, did it shoot up those ranks pretty uh, quick. It will wait a while. This one's going to be when they're when they're, after he passes away, and there's Tarantino biographies and retrospectives and all this stuff. People are going to be singing the praises of this one. Yeah, no doubt in my mind. I wasn't expecting optimism. Yeah. Yeah, true. I wasn't expecting an opt like, dude, that ending caught me so off guard. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the rewriting history yeah. of, you know, fucking up the Mansonites and shit. What he what that was, what that statement was at the end. What if? What if this cultural this landmark event, which did, it was big. Easy Rider happened, which means the Rick Daltons of the world were on their way out, and the Roman Polanskis and Sharon Tates and that school were coming in to dominate. And he's positing, like, what if it didn't go down that way? Mm -hmm. What if they both work together? What if Rick Dalton got invited into that house afterwards and yeah. got to hang out with Sharon Tate? Why not? To me, it was an allegory for what's going on today mm -hmm. in movies. That was him kind of saying, like, this is me. I don't want to be on digital. Let's let film and digital live together. Let's not completely throw away the good shit mm -hmm. and just build on it instead of trying to cancel everything and start it. And like, I just wasn't expecting that from him. I agree. And I, and I think even the optimism of the rewriting of history, it's like, let's, let's take this dark stain off of Hollywood and make it what it should have been or what we hoped it would have been. Aside from the message and everything, just the movie itself is so freaking great. That's a bold statement. Such a fun, easy ride through there's a little bit of suspense. There's a ton of comedy. There's just performances that are just some of the best you've ever seen some of these people. Goddamn right. And even Tarantino, like he was on Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan was pressing him about, you know, what's your last movie going to be and all this stuff. And basically he said, this was my last movie. The weight was really on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's like my big wrap up, wrap up the career kind of epic. And I think I did it. Of course, I'll have a 10th. And he kind of was playing around like, I'm not going to do this, but I've always kicked around the idea of redoing Reservoir Dogs <laughs> in the sense that now I've got the ability to pull it off the way I could have done it or wanted I'm to do it. I'm not going to lie. I would love that. And and he was like, I'm not going to do that. But he's like, I I've thought about it. that. And I, I was like, that's it. juicy, Junior. Real juicy. But then we're at top three and it's basically his first three films. So what order are we in? Reservoir Dogs, number three. What's this guy's problem? At this point, other than Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs and Jackie Brown are probably like, yes, like they could go either way, I yeah. think. Pulp Fiction is number one. Yeah, you just can't take away. It was lightning in a bottle with Pulp Fiction. It was cultural. It yep. was personal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you name me another director who followed up a movie as big as Pulp Fiction with a film that features your lead character as a black middle-aged woman? <laughs> yeah. Yep, and it's done Never. with sincerity, not sincerity. Like, yeah, and based on source material where the whole damn book was white. Yeah, I always loved that he did that. Yeah, and, and in that one too, you can see how much he, he loved that. about her, her and source Robert material. Forster. That's the thing. Like, I feel like I've learned so much about movies in general just by some of the references that he's made, and yeah. I never saw a single thing that Pam Greer was in. I Robert Forster, first movie I ever saw him in, and now it's like I recognize him as a really great actor and other things. It's like this, just what he brought to me as mm. a young person was awesome and I and I love this movie more now than I ever did before for all the reasons that you said. I can't call Jackie Brown Tarantino's masterpiece because of Elmore Leonard. Yeah. So it'll be Pulp Fiction. It'll be Pulp Fiction yeah, forever. Gotcha. That's how I settle on it now where it's like it's Pulp Fiction. My ass used to be beautiful. Let us know down below if you disagree, if there's anything that you heard us say that you know you want to rebut, 
or want us to maybe come back to and go into a little bit further detail and we'll see you next time.